Bismillah Rahman Rahim and good afternoon and uh, Ramadan Mubarak to all of those uh, who are celebrating, including uh, Dato Shiri. Uh, my name is Ali Salman and I'm CEO of Ideas and I will be moderating this exclusive uh, webinar today post COVID-19 economic recovery plan and with special discussion on role of economic action council with Dato Shiri Mustafa Muhammad. Um, I will informally introduce uh, Dato Siri now. Dato Siri Mustafa Muhammad is currently the minister in the Prime Minister Department in charge of the economy. He is the member of Parliament for Delhi and was first elected in 1995. His first stint in the cabinet was as Minister of Entrepreneurial Development, and as the Asian financial crisis hit Malaysia, Dato Siri was later appointed as the second finance minister in 1998 making him the first Malaysian to hold two ministerial portfolios at the same time. He has also served as the Minister for Higher Education, Minister for Agriculture and Agro-Based Industry, and Minister for International Trade and Industry. Dato Siri Mustafa holds a first-class honours degree in economics from University of Melbourne and a master's in economic development from Boston University. And that is the only thing which Dato Siri and I have common that having studied economics from Boston University. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Siri, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, in this exclusive webinar. Uh, happy, Ramadan. Remi, happy Ramadan to you. And uh, this is all we understand. Uh, we are living through very unprecedented crisis. We have never faced uh, such moments uh, before. Uh, very difficult choice by the governments uh, all over the world and including Malaysian government when it has to choose between uh, lives and livelihood. And uh, certainly one of the most uh, difficult uh, challenge, uh, challenging moments for you as a policymaker, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, at the outset, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, you and the Malaysian government for very actively uh, managing the crisis uh, so far. And we are all, of course, um, waiting uh, that uh, as soon or sooner or later, these restrictions will be lifted, and we can uh, we can go back to the normal economic activity. Um, Dato Siri, I'm I'm sure as a member of parliament and uh, as a minister in this uh, government, you would already be aware of many issues and and feedback which people from various walks of life, including business, industry. Um, are bringing to you in, in terms of uh, how they are coping with their crisis. And uh, we also acknowledge that the government has already announced series of stimulus packages to um, help the economy, to help the enterprises, SMEs, uh, which is indeed a welcome step. Uh, in today's uh, webinar, we will uh, discuss some of these measures, um, and I will have... Um, some questions. Um, so the arrangement would be uh, that uh, we have about one hour and uh, in the first maybe half hour or, or 40 minutes, I will have some questions for you. And then later on, uh, we will be attending to at least some of the questions which the audience is uh, posing on our chat. Um, so I think, let me just begin um, by requesting you to elaborate in general the role of Economic Action Council, uh, which has been set up uh, under the new government um, in general its role and particularly focusing on uh, mitigating this crisis. Over to you, Dato Siri. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <clears throat> Very good afternoon to our Muslim brothers and sisters. Selamat uh, berpuasa uh, to all of you. And thank you for uh, encouraging this uh, uh, seminar, webinar, or video conferencing. I'm more comfortable with video conferencing. Uh, firstly, uh, uh, the Economic uh, Action Council was set up on the 11th of uh, March uh, this year, uh, a few days after the, the new government was set up, yeah? a few days after Tasu Miriam became uh, Prime Minister. The main objective of this council is to be a platform uh, to uh, get feedback and uh, uh, decide on, well, of course, to monitor 
economic and other developments in the country on a regular basis. And uh, the, the Prime Minister chairs all these meetings and the meetings are held uh, uh, once a week, every Monday. And uh, we have Secretariat, it's a joint Secretariat between the Ministry of Finance and the Economic uh, Planning Unit. We have an, an, an Executive Director, Professor Tan Sri Azlan, the former Vice Chancellor of UKM, uh, is, the, is running this uh, Secretariat. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, groups have been formed uh, the main purpose is to, to act as a listening board. Uh, and I, I just want to uh, share with you that uh, the Prime Minister is very focused on, on COVID. Uh, health, of course, number one. Uh, economic matters uh, are equally important. Uh, he's got a good team, led by him, of course. And we have an economic cluster. As you know, there are four senior ministers. Uh, one cluster is the economic cluster headed by the three husband. The meeting minister is senior minister uh, uh, heading the economic cluster. And under him, among others, uh, uh, he's got the Minister of Finance, who's doing a lot of work uh, in terms of uh, uh, recovery plan. Uh, and I'm part of the team. And Councilor uh, uh, Muidin has uh, announced uh, two packages thus far. The first one was announced on the 27th of, of March, and the second one was announced on the 6th of April. So there's been two uh, stimulus packages in dealing with the, with the crisis. The first one was introduced by the previous government on the 7th of February. So there's been four, there's, sorry, three packages so far. So the main purpose, uh, once again, is to be hands-on, to understand what's going on uh, in Malaysia and indeed the world, and to respond very quickly. The whole idea is to respond very quickly to these developments uh, and come up with uh, comprehensive uh, strategies. Uh, so far, we've been getting very good feedback. Uh, the Prime Minister has done uh, well. Uh, and uh, uh, feedback we receive both in the form of surveys and anecdotal evidence indicates that, especially the B40 and micro enterprises, uh, they are pleased with the help given by the Ministry of Finance and the Government of Malaysia. Uh, and we have been working very closely, all of us, focusing on this uh, COVID crisis. Of course, the frontliners are mainly people in the Ministry of Health, the Health Minister, the Director uh, General of Health, and the whole. Uh, uh, staff of Minister of Health are working very hard to contain this uh, pandemic. And we also have, besides the health frontliners, we are uh, beginning to have economic frontliners as well. These are uh, people who are uh, beginning, some of them uh, are beginning to work. This is equally important. Uh, the fact is, uh, uh, there will come a moment when, to, when we need to uh, have a, a good look at what's happening. As I say, health has been a number one issue. We've been very successful in containing this pandemic. Uh, and whatever uh, opening we have decided in the last uh, few weeks, uh, of course, these are all contingent to uh, uh, very strict protocols imposed by the Ministry of Health. Yeah? So uh, this is what we've been doing in the last few, few weeks. Uh, 11th of March, this is 24th uh, of, of, of April. So we've been around for only about, uh, about, uh, about uh, five, six weeks, the economic council. Yes, I'll be over to you. Ah, I can't hear you. We're having, we're having a problem. Can you, can you hear me? Uh, okay. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, thank you so much, Dato Siri, for providing an overview of uh, the framework of uh, National Economic uh, Planning and Economic uh, Action Council. I think this, this is very comforting to know that how government has been continuously monitoring the feedback received from uh, the various uh, stakeholders in terms of its policies. And I'm sure this is uh, uh, feeding directly into, into the policy making also. Um, uh, as you already have uh, mentioned that uh, it is important, like you, you use the, the word economic frontliners, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick up from that word. Um, I, I like the term economic frontliners. Um, so uh, have the government uh, thought about um, like any priority uh, sectors? Um, of course, we have received the news and uh, we have been hearing various uh, policy announcements, but it will be uh, helpful for us and our uh, audience to understand from, listen from you that what are the priority sectors uh, which the government has planned? Well, this has been done by the senior minister uh, meeting minister uh, in two phases. Uh, the first phase has got to do with this, what called essential services, uh, 10 altogether. Food, of course, is, is very important. Uh, pharmaceutical medicines, this is another important sector. 
and some of the uh, services like utilities and uh, in the first batch of, of uh, opening up uh, included in that was electrical electronics, for example, uh, which are some of them are part of the value chain. So that was the first part. The second opening was about a week ago, um, uh, and this uh, covers about eight sectors altogether, including construction. Yeah, uh, and uh, for the opening of aerospace, for example, has, has been given the, the go ahead. But all these have been uh, approved, subject to very strict protocols imposed by Sirata. That's very important. So the number one priority for the government is to ensure that people are safe yeah, in terms of health, uh, spread of the uh, pandemic is, is contained, uh, and, uh, uh, and if there is any transgression of those rules and procedures, uh, the uh, ministry will, will act very decisively in withdrawing the approval. So we've done this in stages, uh, and uh, this has been done in consultation, especially with the Ministry of Health, with uh, of the observation of very strict protocols. So, uh, do you do you see that uh, these uh, guidelines and these protocols um, are going to be taken uh, uh, seriously in terms of implementation? Um, and what what will be the source of course of action? Let's say if you if you if there's a report uh, from one industry or, or cluster that these protocols are not being observed, um, and so. Is the government thinking about, has thought about like penalties or any actions which can, uh, it can, it can take to control these? Well, by and large, relations have been very disciplined, very well behaved. There's not been too many naughty ones. Yeah? Uh, police have uh, erected roadblocks uh, throughout the country and there's been some uh, transgressions uh, and they have been compounded. Some have been uh, uh, brought to court. So that, that's the health side. Uh, this, uh, this is this is the the MCO part, the movement uh, 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 control order, uh, which is mandatory for many people. So in general, Malaysians have, have behaved themselves. Uh, there's been some people who who have been uh, flouting the laws, regulations, but overall, I think uh, uh, it's okay. Yeah, and the same is true with uh, companies which have been given approval by MITI. Um, we have I'm, I've been told that there's been a very small number of uh, companies which have uh, not took the line and action has been taken uh, by, by VT. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the bottom line is that uh, this is uh, working well. Uh, in general, companies have been following the rules and regulations set, or SOP set by the Ministry of Health, and uh, MIT has been uh, on the ground with the help of other agencies to ensure that uh, these conditions are, uh, are adhered to. Uh, the fact that we do not have too many problems, I think, indicate that this is working uh, quite well. Um, and uh, let me just now turn uh, the, the the topic to uh, a related topic, issue of like uh, geographic clusters. Uh, so you have mentioned about uh, economic clusters. You have mentioned about uh, which industries are giving uh, are being given priority and under the protocol. But according to some observations, uh, some states like uh, Penang, Perlis, Kalantan have been not been observing any new cases. Uh, so, is there any thinking in the government to um, sort of allow fuller activity, fuller economic activity in uh, in such states or in such geographical clusters? Has there any been uh, thinking like that currently? Uh, firstly, uh, when it comes to clusters, uh, the red zones, green zones. Uh, these these uh, decisions are made by the Ministry of Health. Yeah, uh, I'm not an expert in in health matters, and neither do I have the standard to to comment on those issues. But in general, I mean, some of these things are in the public domain. For a list, for example, is, is a green state. Yeah, there's not been a, a case, a single case in the, in the last uh, few days. So there is some thinking in government that uh, we should look into the possibility of uh, relaxing. Uh, some movement uh, in the green green uh, areas, green districts or green localities. Now uh, the health authorities are, are zoning in uh, not only at district level but also localities within a district. So this is within the period of purview of the health ministry. But going forward, uh, because uh, the MCO is being standard uh, by another two weeks, as announced by the prime minister uh, last night in a special address, uh, I think it, make, it makes sense. Uh, for uh, the authorities to consider what else can be opened up. And uh, it is a, a continuous uh, process. 
but whatever the government does uh, is, is subject to the protocols, as, as, as I said, by the Ministry of Health. I think the, the priority remains health. We do not want to make sure, we want to make sure that the, the pandemic is, is, is well under, under control. Uh, and so far, uh, I must say, uh, at a personal level, and I, I suppose my colleagues as well in the government are quite happy uh, with compliance. Uh, but there's been a few, not too many, uh, cases of companies which have not observed those protocols, but in the context of the overall uh, approval number, uh, company, number of companies approved, uh, I think it is a number that, that that's more. So th that's encouraging to, to hear. Um, uh, let me ask you another uh, question, which is, uh, uh, you mentioned about the uh, stimulus uh, packages uh, in, the, in the beginning, and you mentioned that, uh, including the previous government, we have now heard uh, uh, three stimulus packages. And um, uh, can you elaborate uh, the, the role being given or played by the GLCs in, in this particular uh, scenario, especially with regard to stimulus package, and where do you see their role going on um, in the economic recovery plan in the future? The three stimulus packages, namely 27 February, 27 March, and 6 April, these have been mainly driven by the of Finance. Uh, it's got to do with, uh, with allocations from the government. It's got to do with uh, the banking system, uh, central bank. Uh, also, uh, some GLCs have been uh, required to play a role. What's important is that uh, we're coming together, the public and private sector. I think this is a time where we, we, we've noticed, uh, I mean, it's a new normal, of course, uh, changes in consumer behavior. But at the same time, Malaysians are getting closer to each other. Yeah? We're more united. The government is, is, is very united. We speak with one voice uh, in the cabinet. We focus on, on addressing uh, health and economic challenges uh, during this uh, COVID era, MCO uh, period. So this is, this is something that, that, that we're proud of, that people are working together. The public sector, of course, is working very hard, so finance and others, BT and others. And the private sector is coming forward. They've come, uh, come forward to to uh, provide donations to, to uh, hospitals and other NGOs, food, of course, as well. The religious authorities in every state have come forward. State governments have also been quite forthcoming. Uh, the biggest, of course, comes uh, from, from the government, 260 billion, and that 260 billion of, 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 of injection of uh, the value of stimulus packages, uh, three altogether, uh, has got uh, three major components. One, of course, is federal government. Uh, number two, a few GLCs, yeah? uh, and number three, uh, the banking system. Yeah? So your question on GLCs, uh, I think uh, uh, we're pleased that they've come forward. Uh, some of them have contributed to the COVID fund. Some of them have, uh, have their own programs in providing ventilators uh, uh, to, to hospitals. Uh, and of course, in the case of the EPF uh, and so so, they've showed, showed that a bigger responsibility compared to other, other GLCs. So uh, once again, uh, we are united. Yeah, the public and private sectors will be working closely with, with each other. Uh, everyone has come forward. Some individuals, religious uh, zakat, you know, from throughout the country, state governments have been uh, quite forthcoming. So we put all these things together. Uh, I mean, the reason why we are able to uh, weather the storm uh, is because uh, the federal government is very, very, very much focused on the COVID issue. The health authorities, Ministry of Finance, and other agencies in government. Uh, GLC is also supporting us, the private sector as well. As a matter of fact, individuals are also uh, chipping in uh, to alleviate the, the burden, especially of the B40 and also micro enterprises. Yeah, uh, I have no doubt. I think this is, uh, as you have explained, uh, that uh, this crisis is a moment uh, where uh, all Malaysians come together and contribute to each other. Uh, yeah as uh, together in, in uh, recovery and in, you know, in, in hopefully that will be uh, very effective in, in the times to come. Um, uh, but within your own uh, uh, domain uh, and in the economic affairs, uh, if I could uh, indulge you further on um, the uh, this year, 12th uh, five-year plan um, um, has been uh, planned, uh, you know, will be, will be announced, um, but as we know that um, the COVID-19 crisis uh, all around the world and Malaysia is no exception, um, has, has changed fundamentals, has changed uh, many assumptions. 
And um, in fact, uh, let me also add uh, that uh, not only COVID-19, but before that we had been seeing uh, oil crisis. And again, we have re recently observed unprecedented low levels, uh, actually negative territory, which we had never observed um, in, uh, the in the oil commodity. And we know that Malaysia has been dependent um, uh, on the oil revenue. Um, so COVID-19, uh, oil crisis, and the 12th five-year plan, if you can share any thoughts on that, how it's going to affect and, and how government is re re rethinking through it. Uh, firstly, uh, not many people expected the pandemic to last this long when it first started, of course. Eh? Uh, and in respect of MCO, when it first started in, in Malaysia about five weeks ago, we thought it was going to last for only two weeks. You know? yeah. Now it's, it's, it's going to the fifth, sixth week, and now for the extension. So this is uh, totally unexpected, the duration. And uh, we did not, in the beginning, fully understand the full impact. Tourism, for example, has, has been the worst hit. Uh, a few hotels have been closed completely, and those hotels which, are, which will remain open has got very, very low occupancy rates yeah, of um, 5%, 10% which is never, never in Malaysian history. Of course, we never encountered roadblocks yeah, for so long. Right. Yeah? Uh, we're closer to the family, which is a good thing, uh, but some people are getting quite, quite restless staying at home for so long. So this is uh, un unprecedented, and it's got a big impact on businesses, micro-enterprises, SMB Corp and Stats Department, they have done surveys, uh, the various organizations, FMM, Chinese Chamber and others, they've shared with us uh, some of the findings of the surveys, and all those indicate uh, that micro enterprises and others have been uh, badly had. People in retail, uh, you know, have been telling us that the, the business has been uh, badly affected eh? because that's got to do with tourism as well. So the extent, I mean, in the beginning, uh, of course, as you know, IMF uh, has got uh, you know forecast world economy, which is looks all right, but now I think many people are uh, are saying that it's going to be a lot worse than earlier predicted. So overall, the magnitude of this crisis. Uh, nobody really anticipated. So for us in Malaysia and indeed the world, you mentioned uh, in our case oil and also the uh, 12th Malaysia plan. Oil, of course, has been a very important uh, uh, commodity for Malaysia in the last 30 years. Uh, oil has contributed a lot to Malaysia's development. Indeed, quite a bit of development in Malaysia has got to do with oil. KLCC, uh, you know, and uh, Putrajaya for that matter, uh, you know, have uh, been financed uh, uh, by, by, by uh, 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 Holdings, which is, of course, uh, got to do with Petronas. So oil has played a very important role in the Malaysian economy. They provided a scholarship, set up university. Uh, history of oil in Malaysia, I mean, it's a very good story to tell in the last 30 years. Uh, they, they've changed the life, lives of every Malaysian. And for the government, um, uh, we've been getting quite a bit in the form of petroleum income taxes, other duties and dividends. Yeah? Uh, and uh, other uh, uh, duties we collect from the petroleum sector. Uh, some years it has gone as much as 40% of total government revenue, uh, sometimes now around 20. So 20 is, a, is, a, is a quite a large percentage. Uh, oil has got a big impact uh, on, on our economy. Of course, of course, it's got a bigger impact on economies in the Middle East, for example, uh, countries which are more dependent than us. Our oil production is, is small. But because Bretton Woods is huge as, as, a, as a global, it's a Fortune 500 company, uh, the only you know company that we have in the Fortune 500, Bretton Woods, uh, and uh, you know Bretton Woods is overseas as well. Uh, so the impact on on on, on the government revenue, on export earnings as well, and there are lots of companies involved in the petroleum sector, oil and gas companies. Some have done well, not only in Malaysia, our own companies have done well, not only here but overseas. So. The, uh, there's a lot of uh, spillover and knock, uh, knock on effects on, on many sectors of the Malaysian economy, government revenue, oil and gas companies, dividends. Uh, so, uh, of course, this will have an impact on our revenue. And when it comes to the uh, 12 Malaysia plan, when I came into this place about five, six years ago, a lot of work has been done. Yeah? My predecessor, senior minister, Dr. Azmin, has, has completed almost uh, all the work when it comes to the uh, preparation of 12 Malaysia plan. Uh, when I came in the first few days, of course, everything was okay. But uh, in the last uh, a month or so, uh, things have uh, deteriorated uh, on the oil front. Yeah? I mean, 
WTI forward was negative uh, for a few days, yeah, uh, and Brent is still you know, uh, very low around 2015, yeah. Uh, so uh, planning uh, was done in a period when the economy was, was was doing okay. Last year we did well. Previous year, previous year, 2018 we did quite well. And the forecast for economic growth for Malaysia this year and the years beyond have been uh, quite favorable. But when uh, when COVID came, and now we are uh, dealing with a, a very difficult situation, uh, negative growth. When growth is negative, there will be less tax collection, less dividends from patronage, and all other uh, kinds of uh, all, many other implications. Export earnings as well have been adversely affected. Uh, therefore, we have to realign. I mean, although a lot of work is almost is almost done. When I came here five six years ago, uh, RM12 was almost in place. Uh, but uh, with the current situation, uh, revenues have been affected. But more importantly, I, I mean, revenue is important, of course, but the other equally important issue is that this new normal yeah, is going to take a while before companies uh, are revived. Yeah? SMEs uh, can be uh, back on their normal footing once again. Uh, people are probably holding back investment decisions. So uh, we have to revisit some of the assumptions made uh, in the last uh, few months uh, uh, when preparing the, the, the 12 Malaysia plan. So in summary, uh, oil, of course, has got a big impact on, on the world economy, yeah? not only in Malaysia, but especially in the major oil producing, producing countries. And when it comes to planning, yeah, some of the numbers which we crunched earlier are no, 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 no longer relevant. And now we've got, we've got to be, uh, we've gone back to the drawing board uh, in terms of forecast of economic growth uh, in terms of allocations, of course, will be affected, uh, and various other uh, implications on, on on the country's economy. Thank you. Thank you for a very uh, thank you, Dato Sir, for a very elaborate answer. Uh, a couple of follow-ups uh, on that, um, and um, I mean, there have been suggestions, and at this I'm talking, and in, in the discussion is happening in US uh, that um, uh, because of this crisis. Um, this may be at the time where uh, governments, wherever they are holding assets, um, can consider selling of those assets uh, rather than um, uh, like uh, cre creation, creating an inflationary pressure, which may be the result of uh, like stimulus packages. If you keep on uh, writing, a, you know, on, uh, opening the checkbook, of course, their businesses will be keep on demanding. Um, so an alternative, uh, can be, um, it has been suggested that uh, governments can actually, uh, you know, sell off the assets and use that uh, cash and use uh, the assets for economic recovery to helping out businesses. Um, has this been considered in this crisis or is it is not in the options? Well, government owns some land, uh, government owns some uh, shares in some companies. Uh, if we were to dispose of this asset, it would be fire sale. Yeah? I'm not too sure whether that is a good thing to do. I mean, there are two views to this. One is uh, to hang on to those assets because there will, there will come a time when those assets will be more valuable. Uh, the other view is that uh, we need the money now. Why don't we uh, liquidate all the assets? Uh, at, the at the moment, uh, this is uh, not, 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 not one of the alternatives, the alternatives considered yet. Uh, of course, uh, the this, this, this 260 billion ringgit coming from the three stimulus packages. Uh, some came from direct fiscal injection by the government. Uh, some came from EPF and and, and SOXO. And uh, uh, the bulk of that, of course, uh, is coming from the banking system. So that that's where we are now. Uh, asset sales. I think, it's, in my personal view, yeah, uh, it's not a good thing to do in this in this in this at this moment. Uh, because prices, of course, are, are very low, and you know we're not going to get a good price for whatever we we have to sell. Uh, thank you. I think this is, this is a very fair argument. Uh, you mentioned when you were answering about the uh, five-year plan that uh, like a lot of assumptions are no more valid. Uh, so, do you anticipate a scenario where all the work which was done before you joined as the uh, minister in the prime minister department recently? has to be uh, like restructured? Are, are you going to uh, revisit the whole plan or uh, somehow this, uh, uh, the recovery plan, uh, which earlier you mentioned also the role of uh, Economic Action Council is going to 
take more priority over the five-year plan? How the dynamics would be? Well, firstly, a lot of work has been done. As I said, as I, when I came here, uh, it was almost uh, a done deal. Uh, one very important point is that uh, the, the, the 12th Malaysia Plan and the 13th Malaysia Plan, which, which covers the period 2021 to 2030, this is the period when we, we, we want to implement the shared prosperity vision. This vision was launched in October last year by the previous Prime Minister, but the current Prime Minister uh, has, for very good reason, has decided to embrace uh, this uh, philosophy of shared uh, prosperity. And this is going to be the, the, main, uh, uh, the main agenda uh, going forward in the next uh, 10 years. Uh, we want to uh, distance and living, uh, want to share prosperity with everyone, that's our objective, so that remains intact, that remains our policy. But when it comes to strategies, this is where uh, there's got to be some radical changes. For example, many SMEs have been uh, badly affected. Yeah, Those as SMEs which are not on the digital platform, not very too much on e-commerce, uh, has found this to be a very difficult period for them. Yeah, Tourism is going to be a, a very difficult sector to, to, to revive because you know tourism behavior has changed quite a lot and will change quite, 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 a, quite a lot in the next uh, few months. Uh, we'll be meeting people from the private education industry, for example. Uh, it will take a while before foreign students, because there have been a good number of foreign students coming to this country for further studies, and that will be uh, affected as well. Investments, uh, with the changes in the, in, the, in the global value chain, you know, uh, in the last challenges in the global value chain in the, in the last uh, few weeks, yeah. Uh, so there might be some changes in the investment uh, promotion uh, strategy. So, uh, I mean, this is a new normal, as, as we know, and people are uh, uh, quite accustomed to video conferencing, yeah? social distancing. Yeah? Uh, so uh, perhaps in the future, there's going to be less need for physical offices. There'll be more virtual offices, and that will have an impact on, on property. And uh, as we speak, uh, this is a big issue in Malaysia. I mean, the property market, uh, is is is, uh, is is having lots of problems in the last. I mean, it's not new. It's been there for the last one or two years. So these are some. I mean, there are many others. Huh? Uh, changes in economic behavior, changes in consumer behavior. Having said all that, I think it's an opportunity for reform. Yeah, uh, the shared prosperity vision will continue to be the the main agenda for us in the next uh, ten years to achieve developed nation state, developed nation status by the year twenty thirty. But when it comes to strategies, how to achieve this vision of shared prosperity. This is where uh, there will be an opportunity for reform. Uh, we've been told that uh, when we meet industry leaders, uh, why don't you look at some licensing arrangements? There are many licenses you got to, uh, there, are many, there are many authorities you got to go to, uh, to go to before some businesses are approved. One's got to look at those things. So this is, uh, in a way, uh, you know, uh, God sent. Yeah? Uh, of course, we go through very a uh, lot of challenges, but it gives, it gives us an opportunity to have a, a fundamental look okay, uh, at uh, how we've been doing things in the past. Digital government, yeah, for example, we have to speed up. Oh, well, we've done quite well in digital digital, digital government, but we've got to look uh, a lot more into that. Yeah? Uh, digital commerce uh, is going to be dominant. Cashless society wallets, for example, yeah, when uh, when we are dispersing. Uh, a to the poor B40 and M40. Uh, I mean, people have got to queue up. Yeah? Long queues in some parts of the country. Uh, they've got to call the police to control the crowd. And this has got to do with uh, the fact that, uh, you know, many people still need cash because we're not a cash society yet. We are far behind compared to China. So these are some fundamental issues that we've got to deal with. And this is an opportunity when it comes to uh, medium to long term reform, uh, which is what the, the 12th Malaysia plan and the the, the, 10th, I mean, the, the next one, the 13th pressure plan is all about. This is an opportunity to have a hard look at how we've been doing things, how we can simplify processes, how, can, how we can reduce bureaucracy and red tape, and inshallah, we hope to be able to come up stronger out of this challenge. Right. Uh, thank you so much. I, I will now refer to uh, many of the questions, uh, Dr. Siri, which have been asked uh, in our chat box. Uh, question and answers uh, 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 box, and, and, and uh, there are too many. So we will not be taking, obviously, all the questions, but I'll use uh, maybe next about uh, 20 minutes or so in referring to these questions. Uh, you have answered uh, 
actually many of these issues already in your um, very comprehensive responses. But uh, I think I will uh, maybe emphasize on a couple of uh, points uh, to begin with. Um, so going back to the post-MCO recovery discussion where we started, I think uh, most of the questions are coming uh, from that concern, like economic recovery, when it will happen, and how it will happen, Malaysia growth rate. There have been questions on the uh, also women uh, role in the economy and how if the government is paying any special attention to women at SMEs. Uh, but I think one key concern which I'm seeing in the questions is that uh, MCO lifting when it comes, because we recently saw it extended. Um, and and you, are, you already said that the health ministry is playing the key role, so that is understood. But still, you're part of the uh, decision making, you're, you're heading the Economic Action Council. So I believe that that is your mandate to sort of uh, uh, lead the economic recovery. Uh, recovery. Uh, can I ask, uh, based on these questions, like what are the factors um, um, or like trigger points which government has considered that, okay, if these factors are achieved, then we'll be uh, going back to a new normal, uh, normal economic activity. Can you elaborate on those factors? Uh, firstly, uh, I, I, I'm in no position to uh, answer this uh, precisely. Uh, firstly, I'm not the Minister of Health and I'm no expert in, in health matters either. Uh, as a guiding principle, uh, once again, uh, I want to emphasize that health remains a very important issue for the government, indeed the people of Malaysia. I'm very conscious of the health. I mean, this crisis taught us how important it is for all of us uh, to, to be healthy and to have a good health infrastructure. And they've done a wonderful job. Uh, I mean, our doctors and nurses throughout the country, they, they, they've done a wonderful uh, the job they've done in the last uh, few weeks. Eh? So um, the, the uh, uh, indicators will be, I mean, for example, if there are lesser number of uh, uh, new cases uh, tested uh, positive, uh, lesser number of deaths, for example, I mean, the government's going to be guided once again by the Ministry of Health. But uh, of course, it's got to do with uh, how successful we've been in controlling this pandemic before we do further opening up. Uh, this is a general reply, I'm afraid. I'm sure some of you are not happy with that, but uh, that's as far as I can, I can venture in terms of uh, responding to your, your question. I mean, of course, it is, uh, jobs are important, employment is important, micro-enterprises, large uh, companies are important, but the number one issue is self once again. So uh, the opening up, the gradual opening up will be contingent upon, are we going to be advised by the Ministry of Health? The, the, the Ministry of Health will continue to play a very important role uh, in this process of gradual opening up. I can, yes. say, I can say that much. Yes, no, no I, I, I totally agree that that is perhaps the, not your primary mandate here. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but since I was trying to sort of uh, uh, represent the most of the questions, so uh, yes. that is that I part of conveying that uh, to you. Um, the uh, other set of questions uh, which have been raised is uh, actually uh, like not in Malaysia, but like cross-border ASEAN, uh, global value chain, the role of the trade. I mean, Malaysia historically uh, open economy dependent on the trade historically. But um, um, I would say there are two parts of this question. So one part is like, uh, what are the immediate uh, concerns um, um, as far as the uh, breaking down of these international supply chains is concerned? Um, so any, any thoughts on that? And secondly, your general view, this is, this is your own sort of intellectual view on the future of the free trade in the world where uh, these international supply chains seems to have been uh, broken down or suspended and many countries were already, even before COVID, were leading to more economic uh, nationalism, if I could say that. So policy and then your own view. Firstly, uh, as you know, the, the WTO has come up with a with a statement that trade will contract about, about a third this year, yeah, which is a huge drop in trade. One third is huge uh, for a trading nation. Of course, we don't think ours will be drop by 30%, but it's going to be a, a fairly big number. Uh, there'll be a drop for sure, 
and it's a big big number, not as much 30%, perhaps in the case of, of, of Malaysia. Uh, that's got to do with uh, lack of demand. In, in the case of oil, for example, people are not flying, people are not using cars, and demand has slumped. Uh, and uh, there's, I mean, now they are they got to pay people to store oil in some parts of the world, and oil is stored stored in vessels instead of normal places in tanks. Eh? So this is a, a very difficult situation, and some products cannot be sold. Yeah, this issue of a global value chain. I mean, Malaysia is very much part of this global. We, one of the biggest trading nations in the world in terms of percentage of GDP, 160, 70%, 160% export and imports uh, uh, compared to our GDP. So we are, you know, in terms of trade, we are very trade dependent. So Malaysia is going to be affected. And the fact is Malaysia has been very much part of the global value chain. And when this chain is, is, is broken, uh, therefore we are not in a position uh, to supply the products. And mind you, we also depend on imported products. Some of the things that we do in Malaysia depends on components coming from China, for example. I mean, it's not only Malaysia exporting to China, it's also Malaysia importing from China to produce some of the products uh, in this country. So the impact is huge. And, and that's why this gradual opening of some sectors, yeah, hopefully will we'll alleviate uh, the, uh, the uh, will we'll prevent an even steeper decline. Uh, that's why uh, I know that our colleagues in MITI are working very hard uh, to see what else can be done yeah, in order to open the Malaysian economy, open subject to strict health protocol. Uh, some small medium enterprises are anxious to start work because SMEs are the backbone of, of any economy. And some of them are part of the value chain. Some the SMEs, some Malaysian SMEs uh, are, are globally competitive. And, and we have many uh, people in Malaysia in the informal sector uh, we have a workforce of about 15 million and at least 5 million now in the, in the formal se sector. These are people uh, who are, some of them are daily rated, some of them have got no EPF, some of them have got no SOXO. So these are people who have been uh, adversely affected. So trade, yes, yeah, as will be affected. Uh, in terms of recovery, well, IMF has come up with a, a number of, a figure of 9% next year. Some people say that's too optimistic. Uh, putting that aside, well, there will be recovery certainly next year. Uh, so the whole this year is going to be very challenging. Yeah? Hopefully next year, Q1, Q2 next year, things will, will look better. Three as well. Huh? Uh, the, the other issue was, uh, I mean, the issue you raised was this, this whole uh, free issue of uh, free trade agreements, free trade. Yes, indeed, uh, people are, are becoming more nationalistic. Uh, you know, uh, the country comes first for us as well, of course. Uh, Malaysia comes first. In terms of purchases, of course, more and more countries have become in, inward looking. The WTO has been going through a lot of challenges in the last couple of years. Yeah, uh, Some countries have become more inward looking. Some countries are abandoning uh, uh, principles uh, they espouse, uh, as espoused by the WTO. This is, uh, uh, to me, uh, being a former trade minister, of course, uh, it is uh, quite, 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 dam quite damaging to the international trading system. So we have uh, quite a few trade agreements in the region. We have the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RSET. Uh, of course, we've got TPP uh, at broader level. So there'll be, a, uh, hopefully, there will not be a stop uh, to this uh, 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 free trade uh, principle. Uh, if we close our borders, that will worsen the condition. The beggar die neighbor policy of 1930s uh, have caused, have, uh, uh, have caused a lot of damage to the world trading system in the 1930s. So hopefully this will not happen. And in ASEAN, there's been some undertaking that, you know, we, we try to make sure that the flow of goods is, is not disrupted. And I think by and large, uh, in, within this region, ASEAN region in particular, uh, we don't see that yet. But going forward, we have to do a lot of, uh, you know, dialogues and discussion uh, to, uh, uh, to discuss the future of the global trading system, we have to remain open. Of course, our country is is is, is very important, uh, Malaysia. But at the same time, we have to uh, look at have, have, have hard look at where we should go. This is a, a very challenging period. Uh, hopefully, this will not result in the closing of borders. This will not result in import export bans. Yeah, uh, and if it's done for a few weeks or a few months, hopefully that this will be lifted uh, as soon as possible. Yes, I, I, I think I, I totally agree with you, uh, as uh, you can imagine that uh, we also believe, as you said, that uh, keeping the trade open is a part of solution, not part of the problem. Uh -huh. um, there's 
There's one, one particular remark I'm, I'm just uh, referring to again, uh, one of the question, uh, going back to the stimulus package, uh, which you have um, um, identified. Uh, the question is that, um, I'm almost reading from it, isn't the term stimulus measures is a misnomer in the sense that it is almost impossible to stimulate an economy in, in lockdown, where the majority of businesses are closed and most are not allowed to work or to be productive. Um, and so, so the effectiveness of stimulus while we are in the lockdown. Well, well you thought some yeah. Yeah, yes and no. Firstly, uh, if those measures were not put in place, we would end up uh, you know, in a very uh, difficult situation. There'd be 40, for example, without the help under the Bantan Prihatin, uh, the uh, micro enterprises without the help announced by the uh, Minister of Finance, for example, uh, without those kind of help, uh, the uh, wage subsidy, which is already uh, in place now by SOCSO, uh, the reduction in employee contribution from 11 to 7, for example, which some employees have decided to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to apply. So without those uh, measures taken by the, by, the, by the government through the stimulus package packages, we'll be in, in, in worse shape. Well, the other part of it is, is that uh, it's true when we have a, a lockdown, but ours is a partial lockdown. Yeah, uh, There's been a gradual opening. It's not a total lockdown. I think uh, probably now about 1 million workers working in various companies have been approved by BT. Yeah? I mean, the last, the, the, the previous, there have been two uh, faces of opening. I think altogether probably 1 million people. I mean, not all of them probably are on the job at the same time, but uh, in total, probably about 1 million jobs have been, well, it was frozen before that, the companies were closed completely now, they open. So, well, hopefully when these companies operate, yeah, and that will stimulate businesses, including small medium enterprises, that will result in some revival of the economy. Of course, uh, in the beginning, I mean, when, when the, the, the packages were, were first launched, we were in a different situation. Uh, we started with, uh, I mean, not, not a single company was allowed to operate. Yeah? Uh, but when the, the, uh, the gradual loosening up uh, was implemented, uh, some people uh, are back to work and hopefully some SMEs uh, will be uh, able to uh, do some business. Uh, therefore, you know, the stimulus package actually has helped. Probably not in, the, not in the very beginning, but as the packages have been implemented, I'm sure that has, has, has had some impact uh, in terms of uh, stimulating. I mean, this issue stimulus, so it is. It has been a stimulus. Without the, the, the two, three packages, uh, the economy will be in, in, in worse shape. And going forward, I think next uh, few weeks, uh, SMIT considers uh, probably more companies, uh, there'll be more people going back to work, yeah, including SMEs that will further uh, uh, lighten the burden uh, of uh, uh, Malaysian uh, workers in particular. Uh, it's indeed uh, good to know that uh, the, the measures which the government has announced, uh, uh, as you said, partial lockdown are, are working. But as a, as a follow-up, um, I'm wondering if, if the, the information coming from the private sector in terms of uh, utilization of these stimulus packages, so you provided a number, you said that 1 million people are already back in, in the jobs, which is encouraging. But uh, for instance, the loans utilization, um, do, do, can you provide us some sense of like how much it is being used currently? Well, um, well once again, uh, I mean, some came directly from the government, some through bank system, some uh, through EPF and, uh, and SOCSO. EPF and SOCSO, uh, uh, I don't know the numbers, but it's been good, yeah? response has been great. Uh, uh, the wage subsidy, uh, for example, uh, uh, has done extremely well. And uh, some people are appealing for further liberalization of this uh, particular uh, particular incentive by the government. And loans uh, as well, the token, the micro enterprises, uh, I don't know exact numbers, but response has, has been great. Of course, we have the normal complaints uh, that some banks are making things difficult, uh, which, which is quite normal in, in a way. But overall, I mean, there's been some surveys. Eh? The stress, uh, Department of Statistics have done some surveys. SME Corp has done some surveys. Some people are getting three kinds of assistance. So when it comes to government, of course, quite a lot of that has been dispersed. So that's the government part. When it comes to EPM, so so, uh, the response has been good. And the banking system as well. So overall, I think from the feedback we get, I mean, as I said, uh, a few organizations have done surveys. 
and they have shared the outcome of the surveys with the government. Uh, people are happy that things are moving. The issue now is that uh, some are saying, how come I'm not covered? For example, we have a category called mid-tier companies. These are average size companies. Uh, we're helping the micro enterprises, uh, small SMEs, uh, quite a bit, but they say we're not being helped at all, some of them. And we have seen some professional service providers, uh, the uh, uh, architects, engineers, and surveyors. I, I saw them yesterday, for example. Uh, they say that they've not been able to, uh, to, 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 to access some of the help given. By so, I mean, uh, most people in Malaysia are very happy, yeah, the B40 and 40. Most businesses are happy, but yeah, of course, there's some segments of, of, of business who are telling us that uh, you know the packages are not helping as much, yeah, uh, and that's coming mainly from what we call mid-tier companies. These are mid-sized companies, large corporations as well, because large corporations, you know, uh, we believe that they are in a better position to weather the storm, and the micro enterprises are the worst affected, and the people with low incomes, the B40, are the worst affected, and that the focus of government health has been uh, on B40 uh, and micro enterprises. Having said that, of course, uh, in actual fact, I think that when it comes to, for example, moratorium on loans, if you have housing loan, I mean, it's across the board, it's not just meant for B40. So every Malaysian, I think, has, has, has said, uh, uh, has been able to access the, uh, the incentives provided in the three packages. Great. Um, on the on the stimulus package, I have seen that some more questions, and and one of the question is, um, so we have seen um, uh, three packages. Uh, do you anticipate uh, another package, a, a fourth package, or do you think that that's enough? Well, uh, that's not for me to uh, to say. Uh, I feel what I can say is that we will monitor developments very closely. We should we be doing. We've been listening to feedback on a daily basis. We see people uh, every day. Uh, the Minister of Finance has seen lots of people. The Prime Minister, of course, the right to him, we see him. Uh, some people have come here and uh, we have been listening. And uh, let me say, say this. The third package on, on the 6th of April uh, announced by the Prime Minister, that was a result of the uh, uh, lots of appeals we received from SMEs in particular. That's why the, the last package, the 6 April package, uh, focused a lot on small business enterprises. That has got to do with, with the fact that uh, we, we, we got, I mean, they, they came to show us through, uh, through emails and video conferencing and some of them face to face meetings. And they shared with us some of the challenges. And within a short period of time, uh, 27th of March and 6 April, uh, a, a, a gap of only about 10 days, the government responded very fast. And that quick response was because the government listened to the problems being faced by small business enterprises. So that, that's my indirect answer to your question. Thank you, that, that, that's very helpful. Um, uh, and one this. related question. Yeah, okay. You got one more? Sorry, one, one related question is that since they are like, uh, uh, I think about five minutes more. We will we'll take five minutes more to, and then we'll conclude the webinar. Okay. Um, uh, so one related question on the uh, stimulus was again, uh, since they're coming from different agencies, uh, including BNM, uh, has government set up a kind of a central dashboard or a control room where uh, different applicants or potential beneficiaries can be screened or and and monitored for the utilization of those uh, packages? Any they, central command uh, It has been uh, monitored very closely by the Ministry of Finance. They've got a unit called Laksana, and the main purpose is to monitor every uh, uh, every help being provided by the government through all the three packages. For example, uh, we have uh, decided to uh, uh, spend about four billion ringgit for small construction projects that's been monitored by the Ministry of Finance. Many of these things have been monitored by the Ministry of Finance. At the same time, of course, EPF has got its own dashboard, uh, SOXO has got its own dashboard, certainly the central bank has got its own dashboard. SME Corp as well has been playing a very uh, important role in recent weeks. Yeah, they've done lots of surveys and uh, they've, become, they've always been the focal point uh, for uh, complaints by SMEs and their role in this, in this very difficult period because there are 900,000 SMEs altogether in the country, a big number. So SME has been playing a very active role as well. But the main monitoring has been done by the Ministry of Finance. Yeah. Uh, 
the Minister of Finance himself is supervising this uh, this initiative, and it's been done also by the Central Bank and uh, ETF. You know, so 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 uh, I think uh, we've done a wonderful job. Uh, I, I think I, that definitely we can see those efforts being uh, played and role being played by various uh, ministries in that um, um, uh, the stimulus package. Uh, the other side of the economy is, of course, the demand side. Um, and so while we are talking about the supply support, uh, supporting enterprises, uh, do you have any thoughts to... Um, uh, to restore uh, demand, uh, consumer spending, uh, well, once uh, MCO is lifted. Yeah. Private consumption, of course, is important. There's been the main driver growth, growth uh, in recent years when it's uh, on, on the demand side. Uh, and uh, when incomes are, are low, people are a job, you know, uh, of course, there's less demand. But this, the package uh, in terms of uh, direct fiscal injection uh, is 35 uh, billion uh, ringgit plus all the uh, money released from low moratoriums and help from EPF and also so, so that will of course stimulate uh, consumption. Uh, it would have been a lot worse without uh, all these initiatives. And government still is still functioning. Uh, government servants are still working. They continue to draw salaries. We have pensioners, uh, which of course continue to 850,000 pensioners, 1.6 million civil servants, and some uh, many GLCs are still, uh, I mean, paying the salaries. So this has been a very important uh, element as well in holding up uh, uh, demand consumption in particular. Yeah? You have the government, you have private sector, and the gradual opening of the economy, uh, of course, will uh, continue to, to, to drive private consumption. It's got to do with confidence, but this point, and there's been a change in, in, in consumer pattern, of course. People are spending uh, more money on food and essential, on, on medicine, on pharmaceutical products. Yeah? So there's been a, 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 a big shift in terms of consumer behavior. They're not buying clothes, of course. Uh, they're mainly spending on necessities, food for the, for the poor, for example. So demand is still there, of course, much lower than before. Uh, but the stimulus package, of course, has gently injected uh, a lot of money into the, into the economy. Going forward, we have to depend a lot more on, 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 on the private sector. And that's got to do with when businesses are open, SMEs are back in business, you know, uh, tourism, uh, tourism, tourists start growing in then there will be a, a, a total recovery, hopefully, uh, sometime next year in private consumption. Um, and in this um, uh, very unprecedented moment, and when you were talking about the uh, five-year plan, uh, uh, you know, I, I, again, I was thinking about the old debate, uh, GST and SST and, and, demand and consumer spending. Have there been any discussion in the government, uh, especially the oil revenue going uh, southward to review the GST again, or is out of question right now? Well, there's not. Focus now is on uh, bread and butter, current issues, yeah? Uh, issues of, of the day will be food on the table. Uh, the, the, the Prime Minister's tagline is, uh, you know, there's got to be food on the table. No one is left behind. So that's the preoccupation. And the, the medium, long term, longer term issues will have to come later. So our priority now is dealing with the current situation. Uh, health uh, very important to make sure that uh, this uh, pandemic uh, is brought un under control uh, to make sure that the Malaysian economy is slowly the most yeah, uh, uh, and it is happening uh, and we hope to be able to uh, open up a few more sectors going forward subject to conditions imposed by the Ministry of Health. Right and in the end I will uh, uh, pose very two very quick questions. One question is asked about actually um, uh, not not as minister but as member of parliament and the question is that um, would you i'm just reading out the question would you please support online parliament session to be convened uh, so many issues have been pending <laughs> for the parliament session to be convened uh, we definitely want all our mps to be healthy uh, well, how would you respond to that uh Parliament will be uh, reconvened on the 18th of, of May, uh, which is not too far from, 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 from today. Uh, it will be one day uh, uh, for obvious reasons, social distancing and all. So therefore, the, some people have, have offered or this solution has suggested uh, this proposal. I go by the major, by the majority view, we see how it goes. But for the moment, let's get this done with. The 18th of, 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 of May is very important, a very important date. Uh, for constitutional reasons, we got to meet at least once every six months, 
and when that is done, yeah, I'm sure that the speaker and others will will, will uh, hopefully things will, will be better uh, going forward. Uh, there's, there's probably no need to have an online parliament uh, uh, when we sit after the 18th of, uh, of May. I'm conscious of the fact that the field is caught, yeah? uh, conducted uh, online trial yesterday, and very, very successful. Day, yesterday, day before yesterday, I'm not too sure, but that was, uh, that was very successful. That, that's good. But uh, the other issue is, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have to do a lot to improve digital infrastructure. Uh, I've been involved in this uh, webinar a few times, and there have been occasions when the line has not been uh, very good. Uh, interruptions. Uh, this one is okay. This day I had one with our friends uh, from Sabah and Sarawak. Lots of interruption. So uh, we have to make sure that uh, the system is in place, uh, access and also quality of access uh, is better. So we better improve on infrastructure before we go full steam uh, into uh, some of these, uh, you know, uh, alternatives, uh, including video conferencing. Around. So for the moment, my, my reply is let's. Uh, get this done, 18th of, of May, that's very important. And beyond that, uh, uh, hopefully we'll get a better infrastructure. Hopefully by that time, MCO is over and we can go back to some kind of normal, not the full normal yet, uh, halfway perhaps with some kind of social distancing, uh, no mass gatherings, uh, schools, not too sure they're going to open yet. Yeah? So uh, let's, let's be patient for the moment. Let's focus on, on, on COVID. Let's focus on health and economic issues. Yes, I, I totally agree that it has to be the priority. Perhaps the implication or spirit was that uh, Malaysian citizens and voters want their parliamentarians also to look into these matters and uh, yeah. provide guidance to the public in general. Yes, we, we open to that. Let, let's see how it goes. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, and uh, I, I think you, you mentioned just, just now, uh, and that is uh, my really last uh, question or, or point. Um, comes 12th May. So 12th May is not too far. We have now been extended. Uh, what happens uh, 12th May? Do you anticipate that is the last date or can it still be uh, sort of extended or uh, what kind of timeline do you see? Well, it's hard to predict. As I said in the beginning, uh, I thought, yeah, I mean, I'm talking about myself, uh, two weeks and that's it. The, the first round, there's only one round of M MCO, mm -hmm. and as it turned out, it's gone beyond two weeks. So one can never predict. But what's clear is that, irrespective of what's going to happen after 12 May, <laughs> there'll be a totally different world. Social distancing, no mass gatherings, restaurants, some restaurants cannot be open. So it's going to be a totally different lifestyle. Uh, and you've got to get used to that. More online uh, commerce, more digital application. So it's going to be a totally, totally different world. Not as many tourists, perhaps. People are not going to travel in groups. Yeah? Uh, people are averse to travel. The foreign students, we used, used to have 90,000 foreign students, some more than that at some point in time in, in this country, attending our uh, education institutions. Uh, it will take a, a long time before that number comes back. So we got to be, we got to get used to this new normal. And respecting what happens, I think going forward, there will be, uh, you know, we got to be extra careful with our health and whatever uh, easing that we put in place is got to be done in stages. I mean, the worry is, I mean, it might come back. I mean, that's happening in a few countries, yeah? Uh, I mean, it's supposed to be gone and it's coming back again in some countries. So this is something that uh, we have to be careful about. Yeah. So thank you so much, Adi. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Datu Siri, uh, for uh, your time uh, on the uh, first day of Ramadan and you spent your very precious time while you are dealing with the, with the crisis. And uh, it has been a great experience uh, with you, uh, yeah, this conversation. And I hope it's for you and others as well. Yeah. Yeah. It is very, we had uh, about uh, 350 people in our chat room uh, okay. and many uh, hundreds of others uh, who are watching on the, on the YouTube. Great. So for all of uh, those who have attended and who have uh, sent their questions and comments, I uh, thank you for your participation. I must also admit that, of course, uh, many of the questions I, I could not take. Um, and I also should acknowledge that uh, some of these questions were not directly relevant uh, with uh, Datu Siri, but he was very kind and generous to yeah. still take on the, some of these questions. Um, and I'm very grateful to you, Datu Siri, for, for these. 
Um, with this, these remarks, um, I conclude this webinar again. Uh, great, uh, grateful from uh, ideas, uh, our board, um, our chairman Tunguzan and Labidin, who are all listening uh, while you. we speak uh, to this uh, webinar. Thank um, you for listening to both. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> See you, soon. See, you soon. See, you soon. See you soon, inshallah, physically soon. Inshallah, inshallah. Thank you so much. I'm at once again. Yeah, thank you.